Uh, hi, everybody. I am John Rennie, and um, I am excited to present to you on uh, mobility as a service. Uh, let me share my screen. So I hope I'm sharing the right screen. <laughs> um, <clears throat> mobility as a service. So first of all, let me introduce myself. Um, I am the director of the Center for Urban and Environmental Solutions uh, and a professor in uh, the Department of Urban and Regional Planning at Florida Atlantic University. Um, I've been affiliated with the Transport Studies Unit um, at, uh, at, at the University of Oxford since 2013 uh, when I, I did a uh, my first sabbatical there. And um, I most recently uh, was in residence there uh, as a visitor last fall, um, only, you know, for a short period of time, a couple months. Uh, but um, it was, uh, I was on sabbatical, uh, uh, had a great um, experience in studying cities in um, France. Uh, I spent a month in Paris. Uh, and then I spent about a month split between uh, visiting South France and Barcelona, and then uh, spent um, about two months in the UK. Uh, spent most of my time in Oxford, you know, uh, took did some uh, tours in London, uh, working on a book, um, uh, looking at um, uh, transoriented development and uh, resilience and sustainable cities, uh, and um, also looked at... Uh, at, at um, Wales, I also went, went to Cardiff and Liverpool. And so found some, you know, a lot of really cool projects happening all over the place. Um, and so uh, anyway, I'm not really here to talk about that, uh, but I did a TED talk recently and I'll try and share that information with you at the end if you wanna learn a little bit more about that work. But um, I, I put this picture here because when I was a child, I used to love watching the Jetsons. And so, you know, we always thought by this point now, uh, you know, the 2020s, gosh, I remember when, when the, the year, the 2000s, uh, when I was a kid seemed like a long ways away. Um, and we thought by now people would either be teleporting or, you know, driving around and flying cars or flying skateboards, hover, well, we do kind of have hoverboards um, from Back to the Future, but they're not quite the same as the hoverboards that were in Back to the Future. Uh, but nevertheless, um, you know, we've always had this obsession with transportation uh, in, in our media and particularly about the future of transportation. And so, you know, what's interesting is that I think the future of transportation now is looking at mobility as a service. Uh, and um, let's see if I can advance the slides. This was my first, um, you know, one of my, my first car Um this was actually not a photo of my car. I actually found a picture of this on the internet, but this was the same car that I had. It was a 1984 Chevy Cavalier. Uh, and it looks way older now than when I first got it. I When I first got this car, it looked very, very, um, you know, of course, at that time, it was, it was nine years old. Uh, I got my driver's license 31 years ago in 1993. So I was born in 1976. Um, and this represented freedom for me. I grew up about an hour and a half north of New York City in the Hudson Valley. And um, most people, when I tell them I'm from New York, they think it's a very urbanized place. And of course, New York is. But where I grew up, it was actually quite rural. Uh, there, you know, we had massive woods behind my house where I grew up and I would play in them. And it was a great childhood running around playing in nature all the time. Uh, but when I got to my teenage years, it became very isolating. I couldn't get anywhere, you know, unless a parent drove us somewhere. We would go to the mall or we would go bowling or the movies or roller skating, but um, we couldn't get to any of those destinations, walking or biking or transit. A transit was virtually non-existent. There was one bus line that went in front of my house but um, I never took it. I don't even know where it went. I mean, I assume it went down to the city of Poughkeepsie. But unfortunately, the destinations where I was growing up were not in the city of Poughkeepsie. The city of Poughkeepsie was not really a great place. Uh, most of the destinations that we went to were all suburban, spread out, um, more like exurban, actually. 
um, but you needed a car to get everywhere. And so when I was 16, I literally went to the DMV, Department of Motor Vehicle, on my birthday. And I, 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 got, I signed up for my driver's permit. You need to have a driver's permit before you can get a driver's license. But you could sign up for your driver's license test that same day. And so I, on December 14th, um, I, I signed up for my, uh, December 14th, 1992, I believe, um, I signed up for my driver's test, which was on January 29th, 1993. You know, why do I remember these dates, right? These were important milestone dates in my life growing up. Um, I will never forget, you know, getting my driver's license. It was such a an amazing feeling of freedom. I remember the first time I got in the car and drove by myself. Uh, I went and drove and picked up my girlfriend. My my girlfriend lived 25 minutes away. Um, that's kind of the area that I lived in. It was, you know, kind of like the English countryside. Uh, our school district was massive. Uh, we had, you know, you could drive for 30 minutes and still be inside our school district, sometimes 40 minutes. And um, I went, picked up my girlfriend, and, you know, I think we then drove another 30 minutes, 40 minutes to go to the mall. Um, and that was like, you know, the most exciting thing in my life at that time to be able to do that. And then, of course, I quickly figured out that uh, I needed a job because my parents, uh, my dad, fortunately, gave me the car. It was a used car, so I didn't have to pay for it. Um, I was very lucky and fortunate to have a car given to me. Uh, but the cost of insurance was astronomical for a 16-year-old boy. Um, and I had to pay for my own driver's insurance. I paid for my own gas and repairs. And that was not cheap. And so I started working uh, to pay for the car. Uh, and, and honestly, um, you know, I, that led to some issues uh, when I was in my high school years. You know, having to work a lot of hours uh, led to the impact on my school. I, my grades started suffering a little bit. And, and at, at some point, I realized like, this is, this doesn't make a lot of sense. You know, when I was about 17 years old, I was like, I, I learned very quickly that I'm working to pay for a car to be able to get around, but I don't have a lot of time left to get around and do fun things because I'm working all the time. Um, and then my grades started suffering because I would have to work at a sporting goods store until sometimes 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night. And I would get home and I'd be very tired and it would be hard for me to get my homework done, right? Because I would, I would, you know, have to be at the store at five o'clock. And, you know, I, after I came home from school, I didn't have a lot of time to get my, my homework done then. So a lot of times I had to finish it up afterwards and I'd get home. I was so exhausted. I'd go to sleep without having my homework done. And so um, when I went to college, I, I learned pretty quickly uh, life in Boulder, Colorado, I, I went out to the University of Colorado at Boulder um, without a car. And I didn't own a car, you know, there for the entire time during my undergraduate years. Um, I, I sold my car for $900 and I bought a bicycle, a mountain bike, a very nice mountain bike uh, back in 1995 for $600. Um, so, you know, and I also bought a really good lock so it wouldn't get stolen. But um, that $600 bike didn't really cost me very much in maintenance. Um, and I was able with my student uh, path, my student ID, I was able to get on any of the public transit in Boulder. And they have, uh, back at then, they were very innovative. They had bike racks on their buses. So I was able to, you know, put my bike on the, the bus, which was kind of, uh, you know, kind of a name, kind of funnily named the hop, skip and jump. But they were very successful transit services. They had bike lanes that looked like this back then in Boulder. So that was very innovative for the 1990s. And it was great. Uh, it, you know, I, not a lot of places in the country in the U.S. had that back then, uh, but it taught me at a very early young age, um, I, I, you know, I didn't have to work for transportation anymore. I could be free, literally be free uh, by not having a car. And so recently, you know, now fast forward, you know, uh, 30 years later, I guess, 29 years later, um, I, I took a recent trip to Miami. How did I get there? Well, um, I had to take my kids to school in the morning, so I, I, I drove them to school, right? And then I, I went and I parked at the uh, Brightline station, which is an inner city high-speed rail here in South Florida, and I had to walk from my car 
Um, I'm sorry, I had to walk my kids to school. Then I got back in the car. Um, then I had to uh, figure out, oh, I had to pay for my parking, right? So that's what that is when I park at the, at the Brightline station. Um, then I had to buy my ticket, which I, you have to do. I, I bought my ticket ahead of time, but you have to access your ticket with the smartphone. And then I got on the train, right? And then I used a smartphone to navigate to my destination by walking, right? So my trip, you know, in the past, you know, went from being uh, driving and then, you know, walking to your final destination once you park your car to now incorporating smartphone technology, right? So it's no longer just, you know, heavy transportation like cars and trains and, and our own walking, which has been around, you know, for quite some time. But now over the last, I guess, 10 years or so, now we're incorporating the smartphone into our travel. And so this is really changing it. This is my favorite commute that I try to do uh, two, three days a week, although Sometimes it is hard to do two, three days a week, I admit, because with three kids um, and schedules, I often have to drive. Um, and I'll tell you why, our service. Um, so normally I like to bike from my house to the Tri-Rail, which is a, commu a different commuter train that we have here in South Florida. We're fortunate to have two train lines uh, in a pretty suburban area north of Miami. Um, Miami is much more urban and, and it's fairly urbanized into... Like I live close to downtown West Palm Beach, which is pretty urbanized, but generally where I live, Palm Beach County, which is about an hour north of Miami, hour and 20 minutes north of Miami, um, is, is a pretty suburban county. But I'm able to bike and I, I chose my house location because I could bike um, and then I can um, take the train. I bring my bike on the train. Then when I get off the train, I, I, there's a really nice trail that I bike along to get to our campus at FAU. I park my bike and then I walk to the office. Um, so really in any given week, like what do I do? And now a lot of times I actually do check my, my smartphone to check on the schedule of the train, check on the real time information. So in any given week, our smartphone is becoming the go-to place to access various modes. Um, obviously you need a smartphone to access Uber. Um, you, I, I check on, I buy tickets now and check on, on schedules and when the train is coming for both the Brightline and the Tri-Rail, right? That's a inner city uh, high-speed passenger rail. This is the commuter rail. Um, I've used electric scooters that I, you know, you can only access with your smartphone. I get directions sometimes walking or I count my calories or, um, you know, uh, as I'll talk about later, carbon avoidance uh, by walking. Um, you know, I check schedules, uh, when the bus is arriving with my smartphone, I'm getting directions all the time on Google maps, uh, for biking and driving on the smartphone. Um, so, you know, we don't need a smartphone obviously for all these modes, but increasingly the smartphone is becoming our central piece of transportation, which speaks to mobility as a service. So we recently completed a project um, at Florida Atlantic University funded by the Kresge Foundation with uh, various partners um, looking at improving the transit ecosystem for students. And um, what we did was we built a, um, uh, we built a, um, an app called U-Ride. And um, U-Ride is a mobility as a service app that allows for a comprehensive multimodal trip planning. Um, it could reduce solo driving potentially. Um, you, that That isn't really uh, optimized for that at this time, but it could be in the future. Um, we have kind of a, a, a reward points and leaderboard to incentivize usage. So for every trip that you take, you can see here that it tells you the various transit options and then there's biking down below. And uh, it compares the carbon savings per trip, this compared to your solo drive. And it tells you how many calories you burn. And when you do that trip, it tallies that over time and you collect, um, you collect savings that are equivalent to the amount of pounds of carbon that you've saved. 
uh, and and that is done both at an individual level and it, and it's also at a community level, right? So you can have like a goal, a common goal for the whole university, or maybe for a department. Different departments could compete against one another, and so um, it's a way to track your travel. And um, and so it's got a friendly uh, UI design uh, and and advanced backend analytics, which uh, make this have some potential for organizations, even private companies looking to reduce uh, their their carbon impact through a uh, incentive and reward system. Um, and so what we did was we rolled out phase one in 2019, pre-COVID. Uh, we formed a partnership with the local transit agencies and other transportation providers in the region. Um, we rolled out phase one of the app when the phase one of the app didn't actually have the carbon tracking and the reward system. Um, it was purely just a, uh, a trip planner feature. Um, and we used a randomized controlled trial. So the randomized controlled trial was where we gave the app to uh, half of the study participants and then the other half of the study participants did not get the app. Um, and they we we surveyed the students in both groups. Uh, and so, um, you know, it, this was a honestly a challenging study because it was completed really over, you know, we didn't launch a study until after COVID. And we've delayed it a bit. Originally, we were supposed to launch it, I think, in 2020. So we really kind of delayed it, I think, another year to 2021. But the reality is that, you know, COVID was still pretty much impacting our society in many, many ways uh, when we launched the study. Uh, we found some interesting findings uh, from the randomized controlled trial uh, that we didn't quite anticipate or expect. And uh, that really has to do with um, kind of the, you know, our, our campus is a very auto-dependent campus. Um, virtually all the students drive to campus. It's, it's what we would call mostly a commuter college. Um, and we, we had some students also from a Broward College and um, Palm Beach State College, which are pretty much what most people in the U.S. would refer to as community colleges. So again, more commuter students. And in fact, the uh, being a, an off-campus commuter student was a requirement for participating in the study because that's who we were trying to target. You know, the Kresge Foundation wants to figure out how uh, lower income, first generation students, minority students um, can potentially have greater educational outcomes, uh, success by reducing their transportation cost burden. So kind of like what I described to you, what I experienced when I was in high school, right? Um, a lot of students get stuck into this, this uh, routine of, you know, having full-time employment or, or nearly full-time employment and at the same time trying to, uh, you know, take a full load of classes, which frankly is really next to impossible to do that. I mean, if I find that if you, if you work more than 15 or 20 hours a week, it's going to start to impact your grades. And even 15 or 20 hours a week is not easy to do. Uh, ideally, it's, 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 you know, somewhere between 10 to 15, but certainly students can work 20 hours a week and do well if they're organized. But nevertheless, um, what we found was something kind of unexpected and surprising, but makes a lot of sense. Stu and, and again, you got to take these findings with a big grain of salt because, you know, we did this during a period of time and where a lot of students were taking remote classes because of COVID and, um, you know, uh, travel patterns were very disrupted. But what we found is that students typically rely on their cars. Um, and what happens is if they have some sort of a issue where they get into an accident or they have mechanical issues with their car and they lose their transportation, it can really derail them, you know, from, from school. And so losing access to your car for, for whatever reason during a semester means that you may not be able to get to campus. And it means that you, um, you know, you, you lose the ability potentially to, to go to your job and, and to make money and to be able to uh, go to your classes. And it can really be a very disruptive experience. Now, it's a very small sample of students 
in our study that experienced this, but it's something that I really would like to explore further um, because, you know, people shouldn't have their lives completely turned upside down where they, you know, fail out of school and lose their job because they lose access to an automobile, but that does happen. Um, and so, and, and it's linked, you know, it, there, we found uh, associations and linkages with, with stress, um, uh, correlations, but, and, and we are actually publishing some uh, studies that are under review right now. I'd be happy to share those with you. I just don't have enough time to get into all the details of those studies, but um, it, it's, it's something I think that not a lot of people have thought a lot about, um, but it, it, it makes a lot of sense. And um, with mobility as a service, uh, we now have the ability to have backup to options that didn't exist before. Um, but, you know, we're always limited to a certain degree by the transit service qualities. But nevertheless, um, there, there are more transportation services nowadays uh, than there were in the past. And so what we did in phase two, which was completed last year, uh, 22 to 23, was we enhanced the app, I, as I mentioned, with the carbon and the health tracking. And we started to distribute it widely to anybody that wanted to download it. And, um, you know, it um, was, so it was not a randomized controlled trial because we weren't trying to restrict access to, to two groups. We were just kind of, you know, give it out to everybody. And then uh, we then had incentives and rewards and marketing. Unfortunately, we didn't have a lot of money for marketing and we had a short time period. Um, but, you know, what we would like to be able to do, we need additional funding and we're not there yet, is to roll it out in other markets uh, nationally. Um, and so the uh, trip planner features I already kind of went through and mentioned about how you can see on a trip by trip basis, the carbon savings and the calorie counts. Um, it gives you, um, we have the uh, ETA, uh, which is, is, is generally real time, uh, but in some cases, it's you know it's it it may not be. So you can see here the ETA, which is a feed, tells us whether or not it is real time or whether it's scheduled. So you can see real time versus scheduled. So that's useful information for people to have when they're traveling. Uh, the rewards we we incentivize you know by doing like a leaderboard and um, people can you know win first place you know, second place, third place, different rewards, uh, like uh, free free tickets on the Bright Line or free passes on TriRail. And we even provided, I think, some Amazon gift cards, $100 gift cards for, um, you know, uh, first place if, if they came in first place here. So um, this individual came in first place. So I think he got a $100 uh, gift card for that particular month. We did different rewards for different months. Um, so I, I really think this could have a potential, not just for universities, but for large uh, companies and other institutions that are trying to, you know, meet a carbon reduction strategy. So that's one thing that we want to kind of continue to explore. Again, you could look at it at an individual level or at a community level um, and, you know, have a, a common reward across a group. Um, right now, you know, we're just kind of in South Florida. We would like to expand this to other markets in the United States, but, um, you know, the cost to take it to the next level, it, it's either got to be a grant or we are exploring, uh, the possibility of kind of spinning this out of the university through what we call our tech transfer process. So that's like creating a private company to do this. Um, we're not quite there yet, uh, but you know, if anybody, if anyone in this group is interested in working with us, let us know. Um, we we are kind of at the stage where we're looking for partners to do this. And eventually, we'd like to span this around the globe. Um, it can, you know, generate revenue through sponsorship and and like I said, help a win win solution, giving people you know good information. We think that the the best use of this would be for a a university or a, or a company um, to kind of purchase this as a product, roll it out amongst their employees or students, and then to um, begin to uh, work to uh, create, um, you know, kind of individual and group rewards 
uh, for different departments or or, or uh, units within the organization to achieve a common corporate wide goal uh, of of a overall you know carbon reduction strategy. Um, and so again, you could actually connect this with uh, connecting it with local businesses to support local economic development as well. Um, so where do I think we're going in the future with all this? I, I think the goal for the 21st century is to combine, you know, mobile technology, smartphones, mobility as a service, with expansion of transportation infrastructure, both public and private. Um, and that's everything from, you know, what we see here in Florida, which is private high-speed rail, which is proving to be fairly successful so far, connecting Miami to uh, Fort Lauderdale, West Palm Beach, Orlando. They're now building a bright line to also connect Las Vegas to Los Angeles. So there's definitely private money, uh, Wall Street money, that's getting into the large intercity high-speed rail game. Obviously, there's also been a lot of uh, money that's gone into micromobility, uh, bikes and scooters. Uh, there was a bit of a boom bust, and now I think it's slowly coming back again, uh, you know, associated with COVID, with uh, the private e-scooters. Uh, but I, I certainly think there's a future there for, you know, private companies there. Obviously, Uber and other, uh, you know, ride hailing apps, um, you know, maybe in the future with autonomous cars, uh, you'll see Tesla and Apple getting into that game, which you, you, you know, read about in the news a little bit. Um, and then when you combine that with supportive land uses, attainable housing and economic development, walkable, transit-oriented development, um, you know, if you can combine all three of these different spheres together, right, and they, they, they complement one another, um, to me, that's kind of the goal uh, for, you know, the, the, the goal for transit or transportation for the 21st century. Um, we saw this a little bit with the Amazon competition. Um, they, you know, when they awarded the uh, headquarter two in uh, uh, Crystal City, which is in Northern Virginia, it kind of combines all this stuff together. Uh, Trans-oriented development, uh, lots of mobility, um, uh, intermodal, multimodal systems, and um, obviously uh, smart technology is all part of that. Uh, Fast Tracks in Denver is another system uh, that has built TOD around uh, the region. Um, I don't have a lot of time to go into that now. S similar with um, Charlotte, North Carolina, and uh, Atlanta Beltline um, has been another um, uh, success story. Um, and then uh, Greenville, South Carolina, another place that has really built up around trail oriented development and lots of uh, biking trails. And then uh, finally, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida, closer to home, it's been a great example. And my hometown in West Palm Beach has done a lot of great things as well. Um, unfortunately, I don't have time to go into all those details. I'd be happy to follow up further more on the TOD stuff, which is something that I'm more of an expert in, uh, you know, nationally and globally. Um, and uh, my contact information, is uh, it might, you can send me a text on WhatsApp, 504-717-1744, uh, country code one for the US. There's my email address. And I'm also pretty active on LinkedIn. Um, I, like I mentioned earlier, I have a TED talk that gets at some of this. So I'd encourage you to uh, look at that. Uh, if you just Google my name and TEDx, um, you should find it. Um, and I just love this little cartoon, you know, if these idiots would just take the bus, I could we would be home by now, right? That's the mentality that I grew up with, and uh, hopefully that will change uh, for the future. So thank you very much, and um, I hope to see you uh, soon at the uh, live event.